All right, we did have a question in the chat box here. Why have insects never developed resistance to DDT? I gave a short answer to that. I don't know, um, Nicole, I'm also an entomologist, um, but I didn't know if you had any thoughts to add to what I said. No, not really, I guess. Um, you covered it, so. <laughs> so basically what I said was uh, insects did develop resistance over time to DDT. However, there were significant toxic effects to humans and non-target organisms, making DDT essentially ineffective because of the damage it caused to outside organisms. Um, in the U.S., we have something called a risk assessment. The risk assess assessment not only determines the like cause of harm to the organism that's targeted, but it also uh, assesses the risk of harm to non-targets like you. All right, if anybody else has questions, you can put it in the Q&A chat box. Um, otherwise, I could maybe answer a couple questions that may spur something or ask a couple questions that may spur something. Uh, I know foggers have been used in certain locations. Um, are those beneficial or do those have risks? I get, or not really risks, but. Do you mind if I jump in? Go for it. <laughs> um, I'm sure Sonia has thoughts too. Um, and so, and I apologize. Uh, we were talking about livestock. I actually fell off a horse. So I just had major shoulder surgery uh so it's like very fitting that i'm doing a livestock group um with foggers typically when we see foggers or if you see um airplanes because i mean we're talking nationwide at this point i saw someone from north carolina so we're talking nationwide sometimes they're fogging with airplanes sometimes they're fogging with vehicles um, when we see fogging, it's almost always for a vector species. And these individuals work for the public health department. If you have questions about your local pu public health department, you can typically see even when they're going to spray. They also typically do spray at night to avoid pollinators. Um, at least in Nebraska and most states that I've talked to, they try to avoid pollinators by spraying at night. Um, that being said, they also have mosquito abatement programs which can help to reduce mosquito populations because mosquitoes are major vectors um it's obviously a concern we want to make sure that people aren't being exposed to major diseases um but that is one of the big ways that people deal with mosquito populations and if you see fogging like like i said most often like fogging is most often for mosquitoes uh sonia do you want to jump in yeah there there is usage of foggers for fill flies um it does happen i think it's usually utilized for house flies that doesn't mean i recommend it <laughs> i if asked i would usually tell people no because you're not getting enough product out there to kill the flies in the first place. Um, it's not something you can't do. There are a few products that are labeled that can be used that way, but I don't think it's the most resourceful way to do it. Uh, there are times, you know, if you're dealing with smaller biting flies, we haven't talked about today, such as culicoides, black flies, other types like that, those would be effectively killed with a fogging device because they're the same similar size as a mosquito or smaller um, but if you're trying to do the fly control, as we talked about today, I would stay away from a fogger and I would stay away from misters because they just wrong usage, not at the right time, not in the right way. And you're making more harm than good. So to add to what Sonia said, they are often contact uh, or residual. And so if you think a little bit about the biology that Sonia talked about, contact means it has to physically interact with that fly. Um, so if you're spraying at a time when that fly is not active, you're not getting effective control. Um, and if it's a residual application, and <laughs> Sonia's shaking her head no, so I'm assuming she's on the same page as me. But if it's a residual fly spray, uh, one of the big concerns with residuals is they stick to plants. But if that fly doesn't land on that plant, 
you're not getting effective control. Um, often these are situations where you, like when we deal with pests, it's often more effective to deal with the like food control than it is to deal with like a contact or a residual because those residuals, I mean, they work, but they're not as effective as they could be. They create more problems with resistance simply because they stick to a plant. And if the fly lands on it, cool. If it doesn't land on it, then you didn't get effect. And sometimes you run into resistance. So I, I don't know, Sonia, if you want to add. Yeah, pretty much the same. I mean, there are, and I'm not saying there's not stuff we can't do. There are products in the market that are used for premise treatments. Um, I would use them spottingly and only when you see flies there. That's that's kind of how they're designed to be used. They're not to spray in April and hope they kill through October. They should be put out when needed and only as needed um, yes. to get the best results because they're just not going to hold up and they're not going to have impact. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I completely agree with Sonia. So don't expect a product that sits on the ground to work. Remember, you're talking about a flying insect. All right. Well, thank you for that answer. Um, another question is, what sort of measures can be taken to deter rodents from water sources and should be concerned about transferring diseases through shared water sources? So disease transfer through water sources is rare. So I wouldn't be too concerned about disease transfer. Um, for water sources, uh, are we talking about a large open water source? Any. I had one in my pool one time. Let's go with any, right? <laughs> so there are ways. I mean, so again, I have a horse, so my experience is slightly different. We put a metal bar over the top. The horse can still drink through it rodents can still drink through it they don't get stuck in it and that's really what you want like that's the number one thing you want to avoid um i wouldn't be worried about them drinking water sources so much as getting stuck in them um because a dead animal always is a problem in a water source um vector transfer with water sources unless they're peeing in it and if you're like talking about an open water source in the middle of a field, I wouldn't worry. If you're seeing serious issues in a barn, I would start to really deal with the population. Um, but the water source, more the concern is the animal dying in it. Uh, they can cause serious bacterial infections. Um, they, any dead animal in a water source is going to cause problems. Not insects as much, but Rodents, definitely. And Nicole's nodding. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question is, any, or are there any suggestions on fly control around neighboring homes, building sites, next to livestock facilities, stable flies or house flies? Communication. Yeah, that, that gets tricky. Um, it depends on what side you're on. So if you own the livestock facility, yes, and you should do everything you can to hope Hopefully keep those flies away. Um, we're never going to get rid of all of them. Like I said, they're actually decomposers. They're actually being beneficial. We just don't appreciate the benefits they're giving us because uh, the adult stage is not beneficial. Um, but when you're dealing with neighboring homes, they're going to deal with them as well. You want to control the larval stage as much as you can. And unless the home is where the flows larvae are at, it's really going to make it tough. But I mean, obviously there's usage of traps you can put up around homes. You can use treatments around the house. Uh, you know, obviously people all have access to pest control operators. The, the, the pest control people can come out and do treatments of different types. Some work, some don't, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that are available to us. It's about finding what is an effective tool that you're willing to deal with. With stable flies, though, I would be concerned that it's not the neighborhood itself producing them. I know of situations where no livestock are involved and stable flies are present because they grow in vegetation that is piled up and rotting. So if you have rotting vegetation, poorly managed compost piles, which is a new thing to do in a lot of communities, that's growing your own life, your own stable flies um, minus livestock or whether you have livestock or not. And they're suffering just as bad as you are. So. Um, I do want to add that if you're dealing with this in a livestock operation, space is a very important thing. So separating food from water sources, 
separating um, if you are able to manage manure sources. Uh, that can be a situation that can help reduce some of this population too. I don't, I don't know, Sonia, if you want to add to what I just said. Yeah, I think you said it well enough. <laughs> all right, um, that's all the questions in the chat box. Uh, I could add one other question maybe. For livestock producers, I know there's feed additives that could be added. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on feed? feed additives, do you know if they work? If they do, how soon should you feed it before fly season? Yeah, well, technically you should start before fly season with feed additives. It takes about three to four weeks to be truly effective because um, what you're doing is you're putting this, so this, this ingredient, which it's usually an insect growth regulator into the manure and the more manure that has it in it, the more effective it is. That's why you want to start early um, because you want to have more uh, manure piles with it than without it so that the larva are being placed and growing in those treated piles. Um, yes, it works. And sometimes it doesn't. And really what it is, it's a matter of whether or not your animals consume it. So if you give it to your animals, you did your part but you can't force them to eat it. And if they don't eat it, you don't get enough of it out there. Or if they don't eat the right doses, you get one cow or one horse that eats all of it and the others don't eat any of it. You're not really putting us a complete treatment. So that's the biggest downfall is we can only do so much. Um, but if it's done appropriately, the right dosage, the right consumption, and it's used regularly, um, yes, it's effective. But there is a potential for resistance with even those products. So you shouldn't use them during the winter time. You shouldn't need to use them in the winter time anyways. In most states, you really don't have any flies as it is. But, um, and yeah, that's that's kind of the downfall. But yes, it, it does work. Uh, a lot of people like to use it with another topical treatment. Um, you just kind of have to find what works best for your situation because it can be expensive. So. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know as much about cattle control, but preemptive fly control on horses can be as much as $60 for like a small feed through bag. Um, and honestly, it doesn't deal with the problem itself. It deals with right. later problems. It's a preemptive. And so uh, as Sonia said, it deals with the larva. And so whatever flies you're dealing with, most of the time when I see people picking this product up, they're picking it up because there's flies. Yeah. So I guess not not yeah. preemptively. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think it, I like it. I think it's a good option because the main reason I like using them is it's our only larvicide for horn flies and even for a lot of our house flies. There are other larvicide tools out there, like products you can buy, but you have to self-apply them. So you have to walk around and spray them out. Um, and that's not a feasible situation, especially in a beef pastured situation. So it does have its benefits if done correctly. Yeah. They, I mean, they're I, honestly, if, when people use them ahead of time, <laughs> they really reduce the population, which is cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for your presentations and your time.